Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So in today's webinar, we will be focusing on the topic of vicarious traumatization. You may have also heard of secondary trauma. We mean the same thing by these two things. Before we start, I'd just like to introduce myself and the fellow presenters will introduce themselves too. My name is Emma. Um, I work as a psychology research assistant for Chuve's Trauma Form Care Programme. And my role mainly focuses on uh, research, but also kind of delivering training for colleagues and developing policies and creating resources. Um, I'll lead you on to my other fabulous colleagues now. Jill? Hi, my name's Jill Underwood. I'm a psychological therapist within the Employee Psychology Service within Chuve. I'm trained in trauma therapy, such as EMDR and CBT, and obviously a lot of the people who come to our service in the Employee Psychology Service are presenting with some of the topics we're talking today about, such as vicarious trauma and burnout. I'll hand you over to Sarah. Hi everybody, my name's Sarah Robinson. Um, my title is Nurse Consultant Trauma Lead for Forensic Services. Um, I'm also part of the, the original trauma leads um, under Angela Kennedy, a careful watch. I'm trained in trauma therapies, CBT and EMDR. And I'm the EMDR lead for the trust as well. Um, and my role really is just to design, implement and roll out with the support of everybody else, um, everything that's trauma-informed care. So this is obviously a huge aspect of that. Welcome, everyone. So before we do any kind of training in trauma-informed care or any pre presentations, we always like to include um, a housekeeping and trigger warning. So today, although we won't be talking directly about any specific traumas or delving into any specific experiences, just even the topic of trauma can be potentially trauma activating. So we just like to remind you to look after yourselves. You're more than welcome to chat with, uh, chat with us in the chat box and we'll have time for Q and A's at the end. Um, but please, if you feel like you're overwhelmed at any point, please feel free to leave and come back. Um, this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube so you can always access it later. Um, just for a little bit of light humor. Um, the reason we've got Tigger there is because when designing this um, presentation, I typed Tigger warning. I'm really rubbish with the keyboard and it made us all laugh. It may be a you had to be there moment, but I think <laughs> from now on, we will call Tigger yeah. warning a Tigger warning. Tigger warning, <laughs> absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> okay, so what do we mean? So the fancy definition we have here, vicarious trauma, is it, it is a traumatization, sorry, a transformation in the self of a trauma worker or helper that results from empathic engagement with traumatized clients and their reports of traumatic experiences. Its hallmark is disrupted spirituality or a disruption in the trauma worker's perceived meaning and hope. So I guess what we're talking about is that kind of indirect form of trauma. So it's, it's kind of almost taking on that sensation or that experience of someone who has gone through um, a, a significantly traumatic event. It might not be just one encounter with someone who we're helping. It can be very little things that kind of chip away at us that lead to vicarious trauma. I guess the traditional understanding of trauma and a lot of people's understanding in my experience is that trauma is this one big event. No. People often talk about physical events um, or violence but it, it can be, it can really be anything. There's a, a huge social aspect of trauma and it isn't always just one, one really large significant event. When we're talking about who may be more at risk of vicarious trauma, we can almost think about anyone in a helping role or a helping profession. So quite typically um, healthcare workers, any emergency service workers, um, people who work in schools, but I guess, again, from my understanding, because it's that kind of helping relationship, it could be an interaction with a colleague, wherever you're working, or even a friendship or a significant personal relationship role, um, because you do take on that helper or caring aspect. I'll move on to the next slide now. I think that's my slide. So I think in order for us to understand the risk, if you want to call it a risk of vicarious traumatization, we also have to acknowledge that 
a high percentage of staff that come into help and care and services also have um, experiences, lived experiences of trauma as well. So I think um, in the years that I've been delivering trauma-informed care training, um, it never fails to surprise me really some of the myths that there are around um, and some of the assumptions that I made around trauma. Um, and I guess this slide is just really to try and open up a bit of a conversation as well around what we mean when we're talking about trauma. So as Emma was saying, it could be that you are witness to, party to, aware of somebody else's traumatic experience, but actually you may also be holding historical lived experience of trauma and can be traumatised by an event in its own right. So in terms of small t's, um, in EMDR, certainly we use this, this concept of small t's, and I think using the word, word small potentially might have some kind of connotation, but what we mean by that is that, you know, what Emma was talking about, this big event, often what we see is not that, it's often a build-up of several, or, you know, several events that maybe you didn't react to in the first event, or the second, or the third, but actually the fourth event, which can maybe to some people seem quite innocuous, you can have a huge reaction to that. And I think that's the thing that maybe surprises people sometimes. And part of my role is very much to see staff following incidents um, where they have strong emotional reactions to events. And often what I hear is are things like, well, why this time? You know, I've been through this, I've been through this, I've been through this, why has it affected me this much this time? And I think how I try and imagine it is it's some very visual um, and quite childish. I need to imagine things um, in that way is like Tetris. So if you, if you constantly have these things happening that keep building up and building up and you're not clearing out the bottom bits, then you're just going to end up going over capacity in the game. It's up. So I think what we need to try and think about is that actually it isn't one big event. Often it can be, but often it isn't as well. One of the things that I see all the time um, in trauma work and trauma assessment and planning trauma services and, and processes and things like that is, is the power of neglect. So we often presume that trauma has to be something that's happened and often pervasive trauma and, you know, the, the, the kind of experiences we see where there's a massive impact um, in terms of symptoms can often be because there's been some level of neglect as well, um, emotional neglect, physical neglect, um, but it plays a huge role. Sorry, my dog's really naughty and she's going to be barking and making, I can't really do anything about that because she's unruly. <laughs> so um, in terms of neglect, it's really important that you consider that um, when, you, when you're thinking about trauma as well. Abuse, obviously we have all of the, I'll just shut this door one second. Obviously when we're talking about abuse, um, people often make reference to, to these kinds of, of, of ex experiences, but I think we also need to be mindful of things like exploitation as well um, and things like that, because it's, it's really prevalent, especially in the services that I work, work within constant criticism or an inability to express your emotions safely I guess the inability you know they talk about Hebb's law don't they in trauma and you know that things that fire together wire together and if as a child you have expressed emotions um, and you've been met with real criticism or punishment or nothing no one's taken that seriously then that creates a neural pathway for life, how we relate to people in terms of how we express ourselves and, and how much fear we associate with that. And what you often see with people with significant trauma or any kind of trauma is that, and we certainly see it in, in um, yeah. mental health nursing, is this idea that it's weak to express feelings, it's weak to show emotion. Um, I've actually been asked that before, does, does trauma-informed care make people weak? Um, and I think this is kind of a cultural issue that I think it's really important that we raise those kind of things because I think, you know, we have to put everything on the table. But these are the kind of things that these narratives that we have within services and things like that, that it's weak to talk about your feelings and it actually makes you more vulnerable. And all, you know, all of the current research, especially things around Brené Brown and all the research she's done, is that in order to, to be vulnerable, it takes a certain level of courage 
um, to express yourself and be brave enough to be able to, to show your true self. Um, but we often see, you know, services often do present as being quite critical. Um, often at times people don't feel like they can raise issues in, in organisations and or there aren't the systems and processes to. Um, and that's where obviously bullying and things like that can come in as well. And we see so much bullying in forensic services. And that's not just, you know, that's not just with um, service users. You know, a lot of the staff that come into our services have got historical examples of where they've been bullied, not necessarily at work, at school, things like that. I always think secondary, secondary skills like an initiation for life, isn't it? Um, what I'd like us to do just very quickly while I've just gone throw my dog out the back door is think about incidents in the chat if we can Emma if you can just field this for two seconds it's just incidents not necessarily incidents as in things that you know kind of extreme things but just what would constitute a potential for a traumatic response in something if that's okay I figured out how to open up the chat which helps <laughs> So yeah, so just to pick up on some of the bits that Sarah was saying, whilst we wait for people to maybe put something into chat, we are working with some of our members of staff within the employee ser service. We do see a lot of people coming through with some of these small T's, the impact and neglect, bullying, that sort of is perhaps a risk factor, but it shouldn't mitigate be used against people, which occasionally we have seen happen in relation to some of the bullying. Anyway, I'll shut up and pass you back to Sarah. <laughs> I don't think there was anything came up in the chat, was there, as far as I can see? No. Okay. Emma, would you change the slide? Thanks, lovely. So how trauma has a, has a tendency to creep up on us. I don't like them clowns. I think they're quite scary. So that's probably quite, <laughs> quite terrifying. But in terms of just dependency, as we were saying earlier, you know, it can be that, um, and I have seen this when I've been working with people with trauma, is that they may, may experience something as a child that either they're completely disconnected from, dissociated from, not aware of, um, or even don't think or, you know, kind of understand it as being something that's significant. And there's many people, many staff I see who will say to me, well, you know, I had, I had an okay childhood, we, we, it was fine. And then when you start to unpick it and you start to talk about things, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, huge events that you would constitute as being an adverse life experience. But it could be that nowhere was safe or things that there wasn't a routine and such. There was no consistency, um, no boundaries, things like that. And all of that has a has a way of kind of creating a vulnerability I guess to some degree um, to other things that happen to us in later life so we always talk about um, every incident as being potentially important and I guess it's about how and what we do after an incident or how and what we do um, after some things happen to us and how much awareness we have as well about the potential for that to impact on us as well and I guess one of my concerns is in mental health services especially in, and in many services well physical health is the same is that we have this tendency to just crack on after something's happened and try and get back to normal as quickly as possible and I think it's really important that we do that to some degree I think it not never I always say never underestimate the power of normal when something's been really really um terrifying awful um especially if it's over a longer period of time normal can be really comforting and stable um, however sometimes what you find is that when things go back to normal that's when you see people start to struggle because it's almost like when everything calms down then that's when people are able to reflect and go oh my god what actually just happened like has that really happened to us um, but because everything's gone back to normal that's the bit when they don't want to bring it back up again because they feel like this, they should be doing better they shouldn't be struggling like they are at that time um, also, I think sometimes, again, people can people can push things to one side um, and not think about them for many, many years. And I've seen that. Um, yeah, we're probably going to see the effect. This is what I've said, Emily, all the way through. Um, I, wrote, I wrote a strategy for post-COVID, if there ever is such a thing as post-COVID. 
Um, and it was basically saying that I think the critical period for mental health is going to be what we do when everything settles down. Um, I really, truly believe that's when we're going to get people reflecting and really struggling to process what they've seen and what they've done and things that we, you know, the moral injury issue that we've all had to probably do things and see things that are not uh, test our values as a human being. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's, you're right, that's what we're going to see, I think. In terms of um, epigenetic trauma, I don't know if many people on here know a lot about it. I didn't until kind of quite recently, and I've been working in a trauma role for about 10 years. Um, but epigenetic trauma really is really interesting area, and it's, and it's the stuff we inherit from our, from our predecessors, basically. Um, you know, things like, I guess, you know, we it's not just in terms of genes, but also stories, you know, like narratives that we've heard. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but certainly, you know, I was brought up on narratives of what it was like for my mum when she was a child and how tough things were and how tough it was for my dad. And, you know, just kind of that cultural thing and age thing where, you know, it was just so much tougher for them. Um, and every single one of us carries something from the generation before. And I think it's being mindful of that as well, of the role that that can play. Um, and just in terms of triggers, I always think that triggers are just, you know, reactions are clues. And I always think that if you're reacting to something, that's a clue. And you, you maybe need to spend a little bit of time just thinking about what exactly was it about that and try and map them out a little bit. Um, I've just had this conversation with somebody today about um, why, why she has a certain pattern um, to having these intrusive thoughts and they seem to be at certain times of the day and it's just kind of then drilling down to see exactly what she's doing at that time, who she's around, what, because they can actually leave us loads of clues as to what exactly is the, at the root of it. And I think with trauma, what you see is we see symptoms in the now. So it might be a bodily reaction. It could be um, it could be just an absolute desire to not want to go near something or just a dread about going in a particular area. Um, but being a trauma therapist, I'm always going to say you need to trace that back and find out where that came from. Um, and I think, that, you know, they do, they leave clues. So it's if you start to notice that certain things in particular are starting to make you really struggle, like some of the stuff I've seen um, will not feel comfortable going on response um and it'll be to particular ward areas and things like that and often these things leave us clues so it's about working those things out as well and just trying to have as much insight into what and why as you possibly can my next <clears throat> who are most at risk so when we do trauma informed care training and forensic services um we do like a bespoke training for each ward because obviously every ward's different and the climate's different the needs are different staff population is different patient population is different um, and it's co-produced and we spend quite a lot of time on the wards trying to plan what the training is going to look like and what the ward needs but actually one of the things that is consistent throughout all of the wards really is that um, staff are not always aware of how their own stuff can can potentially be influencing um, their own health um, or their ability to manage and tolerate certain situations at work. So one of the things we do, and it's voluntarily, uh, it's vol voluntary, is ask staff to fill out an anonymous A study and just look at their own, their own, um, their own score on that. So if anybody doesn't know, I'm sure you do. The A study um, was a study that was, um, it's called the Adverse Childhood Experience um, Study, and it was actually a physical health study done quite a while ago. And what they looked at is the correlation between significant life events. Um, before the age of 18 and how they link to physical health problems um, and disorders in later life and I think it's out of 10 I might be wrong but I'm sure it's out of 10 um, and obviously all these things happen to you before the age of 18 so you can't really be held responsible for a lot of the stuff because a lot of it is about parental um, influence and what you were exposed to and the higher the score the more likely it is that you'll have things like, I mean, it blows my mind when I think about it because it's things like how, how you know, how does having two parents who are domestically violent or being subjected to a, a you know, an environment where people use drugs and drink and drugs, how can that mean you're more likely to get cancer? 
but it does, you know, there's a, there's a high correlation between um, cancers, between eating disorders, suicidality is like thousands percent more chance to be um, suicidal as an adult. Um, but also things like, you know, kind of real chronic illnesses as well, which probably fits with what we know about children being exposed to pervasive trauma and stress and high cortisol levels. But I think it's really important that, um, that you have an awareness, even if, you know, just have a look through it after today, maybe, and just have a think about what your score would be. Um, and just thinking about how, how might you manage that vulnerability if you do have a higher score? So I think four or above is indicated as a higher score, um, or significant certainly, but if you're, not aware of those um, events as being significant and you're one of those people who says well I just get on with it you are miles more likely to get some level of PTSD or post-traumatic stress as an adult and the one consistent thing that I hear in a lot of the staff, staff and patients that I work with who have symptoms of trauma is that narrative of well I just get on with things I just crack on and it's absolutely prevalent in mental health services. I don't know about anywhere else, but I see it and I hear it every single day. Okay. So when we're thinking about some of these stuff that Sarah's just talked about, about our risks and everything, we then need to think about how, how can we help? What can we do to mitigate? How can we protect ourselves as well? But I think the very first thing really is expect a reaction. And a lot of the staff that come through to the employee psychology service are very critical of themselves for actually having a reaction to events that happens, seeing distress, and they're very critical. And actually having a reaction, whether it's anxiety about something that you've witnessed, sadness, they're all normal. And then we're talking about burnout and monitoring ourselves. And I don't know if everyone's heard of the professional quality of life um, questionnaire, but what that does is it monitors both compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma and burnout. And one of the things we're very keen on trying to encourage people to do is to monitor yourself, see where those levels are, what's happening, where's, where am I now, where am I later? And just keeping that sort of like almost like self-reflection and part of taking taking care of ourselves. Taking responsibility for our own recovery as well. So it's then if something happens, what am I going to do to help me get better as well as expecting others to help us? And ways of mitigating the stress where we work. Certainly in mental health where we work and certainly lots of, of the physical health care police fire services where throughout the COVID pandemic and this is coming on is stressful it's it's accumulative it's that drip drip effect that Sarah was talking about so we need ways to mitigate that to look after ourselves and some of the things that we've noticed sort of coming through is that um, hobbies and I'm sure we can all think of ourselves or the people that we know where exercise has been like the go-to stressor for people or going out and having a few drinks with your friends, whether that's a coffee, whether that's a bottle of Prosecco, but actually there's something about connecting with people and chatting. And it, that has made people's ways of mitigating their stress during this whole pandemic be absolutely decimated. And it's, um, I think as well as just put in chat, it's really hard at the moment with stuff and connections and aren't able to do. It. And we're noticing that and people are having to find alternate ways of doing things that aren't what they go to. So if we strip out one of our main ways of coping, such as exercise, and I can think of a lot of people I've seen in employee psychology, or I've normally at the end of the shift go and do a workout. I'm not a runner, so I can't go out and run. I've, I've, I haven't got a thousand pounds to spend on weights and a treadmill to put in my house, let alone have the room. And people are, are really noticing that and noticing that lack of connection. So we're then having to be creative and find different stresses and go, I need more than one thing in my toolkit. I need more than one go-to. And we move on to the next one, so resilience, 
and it's like I'm going to start this with I, I struggle with the word resilience which is why Sarah and Emma are both laughing because it's like I think it's become a dirty word I think is where I'm at now with with the resilience because I think it's been used at times against people people have gone oh you're not resilient enough you haven't coped with this you're, you're the only one and it, actually if we think about resilience just as our ability to bounce back and our capacity to recover the more things that have happened to us the more stretchy that elastic band is the harder it is and resilience is not just about an individual it's about how resilient is the team the support network around as well so we've got some of the things here that people think build up um, resilience and contribute to it so tenacity, and I think the easiest way, I, I'm a bit like Sarah, uh, I think visually. So the way I always think of tenacity is that limpet just clinging on sometimes. And sometimes when we feel like we're clinging on, it's like by our fingernails and, our, and holding on. And it feels as if we're really struggling with that. Discernment, our ability to, to yeah, <laughs> absolutely, Isabel. That's why I struggle with resilience. It's viewed as the get out. That's why I think it's a dirty word at times our support network and reaching out to creativity and actually using that as an outlet whether that's being creative with art whether it's being creative with doing something in your garden these things and our ability to have outlets our ability to adapt our ability to manage effect so can we stay in our winter of tolerance do we even know what our window of tolerance is? Do different situations make that fluctuate? Do we feel like we've been that our window of tolerance has become narrow or has it expanded due to things? And our ability to have a positive goal. So um, don't think I've got anything else to say on that until we come to some of the later ones. So I'm not quite sure. Is it yourself, Emma, or the next? No, person? it's me again. <laughs> So in terms of post-incident reactions, um, I try really hard in my role when I'm working with staff. We've actually had an incident the last week where we've had to we've had to spend some time with staff after um, not to pathologize and just to try and normalize a lot of the experiences that people have within the first few weeks of an incident um, or an event or something traumatic. Because I think it's, it, although there are commonalities, I also think there's differences for each person and that'll depend on how you intuitively know how to heal and how much insight you've got and opportunities, like somebody was saying there about opportunities to mitigate some of the stresses, you know, I, I, I've said um, recently, um, I lost my mum to COVID in January and I think trying to navigate through a stressful event in these times is like the Bear Grylls version. So like you've literally just got like a rope and a water bottle and that's it. Um, and it's really, really tough if people don't have access to um, to resources that mitigate things after somebody's been through something. And I think that's what we need to factor in when we're thinking about responding to incidents in COVID as well. Um, we can't ignore that. So in terms of a three month guide, what I always say to people is at that three months point, but sometimes it can be a lot earlier. If somebody was really struggling uh, week two, week three, week four, week five after an incident, I would never, you know, I would never encourage anybody to ignore that. I would say, you know, just whatever you can tolerate and whatever seems to be improving, do that. But there is this sense of this three months guide where if you are seeing symptoms increase and escalate as opposed to settle, then often that's a really good idea to try and um, to try and seek out some some support, um, something maybe a little bit more consistent. Also, just to try and express and talk and connect to your experience. Um, one of the things that we did in forensic services all the way through COVID was to create opportunities for service users and for staff to talk about what they were going through. Um, I think, I mean, I work in forensic services, but I think it's inherent across all services is that there's this desire to kind of want to distract and move away and keep busy and and everybody needs that everybody needs some degree of that but we also need to to allow our feelings to have a seat at the table as well um and to be able to really connect to them um congruently and appropriately with other people if possible because that's where the, obviously the cohesion comes in and the shared experience um 
I've put in big letters, do not avoid our block. Um, I probably would revise that because I think there's something actually quite helpful about being able to avoid a block to some degree. Um, you know, we, we all have different parts of us that have to function and, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate if we are completely um, struggling in every aspect of our life when we're trying to do our daily job so I think sometimes that's a bit of a blanket statement I think we all do that to some degree um but it's how much you're doing it if that's your only strategy is to thought block or thought suppress or just not think about it you probably that's probably going to come back and bite you at some point because I think you know there's a saying isn't there that all all trauma is is grief um just wrapped up in a you know in a different format and I think that what I know from trauma and from grief is that if you don't allow it a seat at the table, it'll get crash the party and it'll be at a time when you don't want it to. So I think you've always got to, you've got to allow time to be able to actually think, feel, connect to those feelings and thoughts and, and the experience. Again, that narrative with staff, I just get on with it. When I hear that, that's massive alarm bell for me to think actually those people probably need a little bit more support because they're not the ones who are going to come forward and it's going to be harder for them to come forward and talk to us about it because that is a completely different way of being for them and it's shattering their illusion of themselves as being that person and normalize but all try and manage that by also being mindful and a little bit aware of what's going on for them as well so I, I don't you don't want to create hyper vigilance with people that they need to be constantly scanning and checking to make sure you know how am I today am I doing all right am I better than yesterday you don't want people to get caught up in that narrative but you do need them to monitor a little bit in terms of the symptoms and how they are and things like that and I think it depends what you where you find that's whether you've got clinical good clinical supervision sometimes you can bring that in if you know we're certainly looking in forensic services at introducing the pro qual um at three monthly intervals with staff who work on wards where there's high levels of incidents um just you know obviously consensual if, if the staff want to do it but it's just to keep an eye on actually where is that person and how are they and that creates an opportunity for a meaningful conversation then about employment support or what the what other support services are available um, I really do feel like it is our responsibility I know I, I, I don't like the whole resilience thing because I think it's like trying to trying to close the gate after the horse has bolted and it almost um, renounces services from having to actually make environments that are safe and conducive to working but I also do think we have our own responsibility for our own mental health and that we should be monitoring and just making sure that, you know, like with anything we would with our physical health, that we just keep an eye on what's happening. Um, we have leaflets. I'd be happy to share them. We have leaflets that we give to staff um, if there's been something that's happened or at any time if they feel like they need it. Um, just about what to look out for after an incident and also what to do and what not to do. So it's very pictorial. It's quite simple, but um, we use them for post-incident um, events. Um, and all of our staff are trained in, all the, all the matrons are trained in watchful waiting and what to keep an eye out for really after an incident because they don't always want to come and see me or they don't want to go and see somebody uh, like Jill in EPS and actually they might have a really good relationship with the supervisor or the matron or the manager on that ward so it's important that they see the most appropriate people and somebody's keeping an eye out for them do, do you want me to oh you're doing symptoms aren't you Emma yeah so remember to unmute myself <laughs> yeah so I guess when we talk about vicarious trauma, it is that kind of state of, I guess, that, that in, internal tension or preoccupation. Um, and, it, and it also can kind of link, intertwine with, with that feeling of burnout, which we'll cover later as well. Um, and I guess with in terms of symptoms, um, we can kind of summarise it quite nicely into kind of three areas of avoidance, numbness, or kind of a persistent arousal state. So I'll go over some more symptoms in depth now. Um, so having difficulty talking about people's feelings or perhaps not knowing, I guess sometimes there's a difficulty there, but it's also sometimes not actually recognising it ourselves. We can detect this kind of shift in ourselves, but we, we can't perhaps name it or identify a particular situation like we said about the the small t's it's not always a very poignant significant event it can just be a very very minor chips away that lead to this to this to this feeling of 
of tension. Um, free floating anger or irritation, um, not really knowing where to direct our feelings. A startle effect of being jumpy, this goes to the hyperarousal, which is a very, very common experience with trauma. It's our brain and our body kind of be, being able to detect danger and being ready to kind of fight or flight the danger. Difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. Um, losing sleep over patients, this is that kind of persistent arousal state as well. Worried that they're not doing enough for their clients. I know personally being in a helping profession that's something that I am just constantly thinking about is am I doing enough am I doing a good enough job can I do more I think it's very common but when it's kind of very constant in our minds and, and can in, interfere with with our lives inside and outside of work that's when we can kind of detect some signs of vicarious trauma perhaps um, dreaming about their clients or the clients traumatic experiences again persistent arousal state there. Um, diminished joy towards things that they once enjoyed. We're not just talking about work here, we're talking about um, uh, hobbies, interests, things that genuinely just bring us so much joy, just kind of avoiding them or finding very, very limited or perhaps no joy from the things that we once enjoyed. Uh, feeling trapped by their work or diminished feelings of satisfaction and personal accomplishment. Dealing with intrusive thoughts of clients with especially severe trauma histories feelings of hopelessness associated with their work or clients and perhaps even blaming others for how we're feeling as well. Helps if I click the right button. So what I was just going to ask some people to do was to think about putting into the chat how might we see this in ourselves at work? How might we see it in our colleagues? What might we notice about them? And I just wondered if people could put in chat and just think about how somebody might act, how you might act, how it might affect your performance, your relationships at work, your values and your beliefs. And I just wondered if people could put in what they think they would see. Yeah. Irritability and defensiveness, low motivation, absolutely. Yeah, that's a really good one, Emily. The disengaging for emails and not getting back to you when you ring, and it's that sort of sense of, of, of avoidance, isn't it? Forgetful, late for deadlines, not seeming present. Yeah, and that's not seeming present both with um, our colleagues, with ourselves, with the people that we work with, tearful, emotional, isolated. Yeah, and that talking about patients in an uncompassionate way, and that's sort of like when we start to be very critical and um, about people using really negative language, disengage that blame cycle, absolutely. Yeah, and then we, we have those people who sometimes go to the other extreme, often seeing the overworking, the long hours and everything like that. And that links back to what, what Emma was talking about, about that sort of feeling like you're not doing enough and that you're not trying hard enough. So we do more and more. And that's like feeling as if it's never enough. And I certainly notice that there's lots of people who come into our service who it's like that, that they're working till 10 o'clock at night, catching up on emails, doing things, feeling that it's never enough as well. Engaging in more work to distract. So we've got some, we've divided these up into some different sections. And I think there's some of the classic ones that we've put in there, but there's also perhaps a few frequent job changes. So not feeling able to stay in one job. Um, tardiness, you know, that's sort of like someone who's always late. And if they were never late before <laughs> and they were, and they suddenly start to always be that five, 10 minutes late for the shifts all the time, that can be often a sign absenteeism and that's not just sort of being off that's sort of like absenteeism someone who would contribute to the team meetings and discussions somebody who would have an opinion that they're in body but they're not there in sort of like spirit and their their value and what they want normally be irresponsibility so taking some of the risks that they would maybe not normally take overwork irritability exhaustion talking to oneself 
this, it, we've got in brackets a critical symptom. So it's if you're always there, I'm sure we've all got off a call at times. And I certainly can identify with myself where I will go and have a chunter to myself. I think that's a bit of a Yorkshire word. It's that muttering under your breath, if you haven't heard of chunter. Going out to avoid being alone. So we see that less in COVID, but people who always need to be with somebody, dropping out of community affairs, and rejecting physical and emotional closeness. So people who normally are quite connected to people and are suddenly ha having more walls. We talk, often talk about building up the bricks, sort of like having more layers where they wouldn't have. So interpersonal, so the times of stuff conflict, and that goes back to some of the things people have put in there about blaming of others. Conflictual engagements, so everything's a conflict, everything's a win-win situation, poor relationships, poor com communication, that impatience. And then we have some of those avoidance reactions that I sort of like mentioning earlier, finding it just too hard to be with those. So it's like people who would normally pick someone up on their, their caseload, they're suddenly starting to not want to work with that particular type of client anymore, or they're finding it hard to do that. They're not, there's the lack of collaboration, sort of withdrawing and isolating where perhaps normally they would. That change in relationship, and that, that can be many things. So it's, as well as the withdrawal, it might be because they've lost, their confidence has gone down because of, they're not sure they might be more coming and seeking reassurance and checking things out more. And difficulty having rewarding relationships both in and out of work. Values and beliefs. The sort of vicarious trauma sometimes goes to that heart of our values and our beliefs and certainty about what we think about ourselves, what we think about the world and people around us as trauma does. So we might feel more dissatisfied we move from perhaps being more sort of like the glass is half full to the glass is half empty to so actually we don't have the glass at all. So with that negative perception, loss of interest, the apathy, blaming others, lack of appreciation and that, that can be in small ways or big ways, you know, lack of appreciation. So the person who would always say thank you suddenly stops saying thank you appreciation for hobbies, people, small progress that people make, lack of interest and caring, and detachment. As Sarah was saying, you know, sometimes we all do need to detach slightly. We have to forget our and um, put our own stuff to one side for when we come to work and um, help other people. But that detachment becomes prolonged. And we've become so detached that we can't connect with the people that we see. We stop to have that lack of that empathy, that care, that compassion, that sense of hopelessness. So sort of like, what's the point? Whatever I do isn't making a difference. There's sometimes the themes that we hear and that low self-image about ourselves. Just, And again, it's this is sometimes where it's been the chip chip effect, as it were. It's not just one big incident it's sometimes that multiple multiple times and issues and hearing and feeling like nothing's changing so again just going on for some of the things i said we're not doing enough questioning the frame of reference so our identity our place in the world how safe it is and i think we can certainly see that in this current pandemic that we've had lots of people questioning their frame of reference and the safety of the world and you know, where things are and our ability to control or that illusion of control. Disruption in self-capacity. So that's that ability to maintain that positive sense of self, our ability to manage that effect, our ability to maintain an inner sense of connection. Because if we have some of those, then we can manage and tolerate hearing the sadness, the trauma, the well of darkness that people to bring to tra trauma and when things are going on and the disruption in our needs and beliefs. So again, some I'm a bit old school. I sometimes go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but if, we've, if some of those bottom layers of safety, trust, connection and everything like that are not there and nothing else can happen and we, if we start to neglect our those things for ourselves in that those bottom 
layers, it can be harder. Okay. Job performance, again, low motivation, more errors, quality, avoidance of responsibilities. And then because it's often polar opposites, we've got over-involved in details, those perfectionists, sort of like it has to be done exactly to the right way and that rigidity. Because if we're thinking about us feeling uncertain and unsafe, we sometimes see people clinging more to what the rules are, that lack of flexibility. Well, I'm, I need to leave my shift now, it's finished. So those, and it's those people perhaps where they would have stayed on the extra five, 10 minutes just while something could be set up, suddenly become very rule focused and orientated. I'm going to pass you to Sarah and have a sip of food to keep me going. So this slide's about overlaps. Um, and I guess what we what we need, sorry, I'm just gonna cough. <laughs> what we need to think about with overlaps is what one I call an overlap is an Achilles heel. That's my, that's how I understand it. So we all have them. We all will be carrying something from our own childhoods, from potentially our predecessors, um, you know, experiences as well. And I think if you're going to be working in in any mental health kind of field um, or physical health as well, you need to understand and know what those are, what those vulnerabilities are. Um, and it's not about continuously avoiding them all the time because that wouldn't be helpful. Um, if you never get exposed to ever having to deal with it and that might venture more into the realms of avoidance but I think it's having a healthy awareness for where you are in any given time and as such how capable are you of dealing with that situation so an example would be um, in terms of I don't know how many people on the call actually work with trauma in terms of trauma memory and detail and things like that but I always remember um I've got quite a good and every every single therapist will have ways of managing that kind of information in terms of how they process that mine has always been to write a lot down of what they're saying while they're processing so it kind of goes in my head comes out my pen kind of thing but it gives me something to focus on it's quite tactile um while staying attuned which is a skill in itself I think sometimes but then also typing the notes up quite quickly um and sometimes catching somebody when I come back up, um, like a supervisor or somebody and just saying, can I just get this out of my head a little bit? Because that was just a really rough session. Um, that's how, and sometimes the other things that I'll do as well is the kids know when I put my big hoodie on um, and in, in 24 hours in a &E comes on, that mum's probably gonna have a bit of a meltdown. And I think I'm crying, I try and pretend I'm crying at 24 hours in a &E, but actually I'm not. I'm probably just completely exp expressing all the grief and sadness that I've heard throughout the day. But I think sometimes what I've noticed is things like in the past where things have just lingered a little bit longer than that. So when your normal processes of processing, managing difficult information, they don't seem to work for some particular reason or something stays with you for a little bit longer than it normally would. And I think reasons for that can be your own experiences. But I also think sometimes some 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 service users some clients just the way that they express things and the level of empathy that you, and, and attention and attunement you need to have to be with somebody when they tell you that level of detail and the level of emotion that can be in in that that you can hold that you can take it with you and especially if it resonates with something within your own life and I think sometimes it doesn't have to be big things it can be I worked with a veteran um, a long time ago who um, described an incident um, where a child had, had been killed and um that child was the same age and sex as my son at that time um and I went home and could see what I imagined that scene to look like in when I was putting my little boy to bed um and it only it only stayed for about a week or a week and a half but it stayed long enough for me to think actually this isn't normal for me this is not going and took it to supervision and had a chat about why that might be the case and then it did seem to process um, but I think we all need to be aware of our limitations. I've certainly recently, you know, my job is to do debriefs or whatever you want to call them, um, post-incident management, we call it, and support. And I'm, I'm more than comfortable to do them on loss, on 
certain topics um but then there's certain things that I just don't feel able to do and I will happily go back up and say I'm happy to organize it I'm happy to set it all up but I don't think I should be the person to to lead on this one um and I do believe it's our responsibility to know our own limitations as well and be able to have that open and honest conversation with your managers and say actually I'm being aware of my limitations I'm not I'm not prepared to put myself in this situation because I don't think people get the best of me um, and I don't think it'll be healthy for me either. So I try and be mindful if a referral lands on my desk and I read the history and I think, oh, this is going to this is going to be a right kick in the guts for me because I'm going to struggle with this one. Um, I'll have a think about what's the best thing to do about that. So just be mindful, is, I guess is what I'm saying. And don't be frightened ever to say that you are unable to work with a particular issue if you feel like you wouldn't do the best job and somebody else might. So we've put a, a quote here. Uh, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. And I just wondered, that resonates to me. I just wondered what, if people could maybe put in, in chat what they think, how that makes them feel. Does it feel something that actually the, they acknowledge to themselves with the work that they do that actually it's okay to be touched by something or is it not what are people's values and thoughts on that engaging in yeah. I'm just trying, yeah. I'm now thinking, I can see Isabel's put there, uh, arguing with a nun at uni, and I've now gone, a nun? <laughs> um, who said we, no. I think invariably we will. I think we will, and we do take things home with us, but I think, um, I think we have to manage that, don't we? I think saying we never yeah. will is probably going to lead us down a path that we're <laughs> going to come and bite, bite us at bite some us point. In the bum. Yeah, Absolutely. a bit of a shock, but yeah, I think we're only human. Yeah, and it's that bit about sort of recognising when we're being touched what's happened, mm -hmm. that actually, where's our limit? Have we, have, where are we with it now? That sometimes we are going to be touched, but are we being, over, is the touch overwhelmed? Are, are we feeling like not only are we wet, but we're saturated? We're wet through or is it just sort of lapping around our ankles a bit and we're managing it and being aware of it so that's what we've got there so we're just going to move on okay so we've touched on burnout in the past few slides and i think it it, it definitely is a conversation that needs to be had when we talk about vicarious trauma because i think it definitely does interlink and we can see that because it's burnout and vicarious trauma as well as compassion fatigue is included in the profile that we've mentioned and um, they all kind of kind of interweave really the experiences kind of can link to each other so we've got a quote here i'm not even going to try and pronounce the name of who's provided this quote but it's burnout is the index of the dislocation between what people are and what they have to do it represents an erosion in values, dignity, spirit, and will, and it's an erosion of the human soul. I'd just like to kind of ask you guys, what, how do you feel about burnout being an erosion of the human soul? Um, is that something that you can resonate with? Have you ever kind of experienced that feeling of, of burnout? Um, if you've got any thoughts on it, just pop it in the chat, that'd be great. But I think it is, it's like a chipping away of your being. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is. And it, it is, it's very much that kind of loss of interest, um, inability to show compassion, um, avoidance. The word erosion seems pretty correct. Yeah, definitely. It, it felt like my soul was falling out in clumps. I, I think that's a really interesting way of putting it. And I, I'd never heard of it um, 
being referred to as an erosion of the human soul, but I think it definitely does sum summarise it up quite nicely. I've just um, commutative effect that you spoke of at the beginning. Yeah, it definitely affects spirit. And I think that's kind of what guides us in, in, in helping freshness. It's our, it's our spirit, it's our, our focus and our reason why. And I think burnout can really kind of just permeate that and really distract us. Okay, so it's important, it's really, really important to realise that burnout is not a result of, of yourself. And it's not a reflection of yourself at all. It is a reflection of the systems and the culture and the kind of environment that we are working in. So what do people think are the six main areas that research shows are the sources? Again, I'll invite you to pop some ideas in the chat. Overwork, most certainly. Yeah, workload is definitely a source of burnout. Yep, yeah, high caseload and lack of support, physical and mental health, negativity from colleagues. Yeah, lack of opportunity to discharge and relax. That that very much links in with, with the overworking. If there's too much work and our kind of capacity is overloaded with work, we, we really don't have that kind of period of time for rest and reflection. Okay, perfect. I'll go on to the slide that shows us the six sources that research suggests is burnout. Okay, so we've got work overload. So we've got that, our capacity is, is overloaded with work and we do not have that time for rest and reflection um, and kind of digestion or anything that kind of feeds our soul or feels our personal professional growth. We don't have that time for development. Um, in helping professions, you know, supervision, reflection is so, so important. And if there just isn't that time there, that can really contribute to burnout because we're, we're just kind of working and working and working and there isn't any time to kind of digest what we're doing, especially when we talk about working with, with traumatized clients. It's so crucial that we have that time to just reflect. Um, because as we've already mentioned, especially with COVID, when we get that point of reflection, it can all kind of just come and on so we need that very consistent time to reflect. Uh, lack of control is a, another big one so perceived lack of autonomy, um, lack of choice or direction, feeling quite controlled I guess by, by the systems, perhaps even policies and procedures, um, feeling like you, you want to work in a certain way but you feel like you, you perhaps can't for whatever reason that may be. Um, insufficient reward so this is kind of like when when the rewards just don't match the, the level of work that you're doing um, and we don't all do things for reward but it's very nice to have validation um, and especially when we're putting such an emotional investment in the work that we're doing it's really really validating to have some kind of sense of reward unfairness is another source of burnout so this could be perhaps that feeling that um you were treated unfairly in a team. Perhaps it is that, again, you have that insufficient reward compared to perhaps other people in your team. Perhaps your workload is um, bigger and larger than other people and you feel like you're treated unfairly by the systems or your colleagues. Um, breakdown of community connection is so, so important, especially when buffering against um, burnout, vicarious trauma that sense of connection really can um, ground us and give us that opportunity to just have that discussion with people and get things off our shoulders and, um, and reflect and process. Um, so I guess when we talk about community, just think about who you work with. Do you feel like you are safe in that community? Do you feel like you can trust the community? Do you feel like you can have that honest and frank discussion with people? Um, and do you feel like, um, I guess that will be that will be treated well, uh, understood and heard in a very respectful way. And value conflict. This is something that I think is such a, a huge, huge thing with with COVID. Um, I know with a lot of kind of the policies and procedures that have, that have come out, especially in healthcare, there's been this this very big value conflict. Um, you know, for example, having to decide who gets a bed. I mean. 
coming into a nursing profession or a healthcare profession, how how can that sit on your shoulders, that emotional toll of deciding between one life or someone else's? Just this huge value conflict and that moral injury is is absolutely massive. Um, but moving away from from kind of moral injury, value conflict is is quite simply what are our values, my own values, and does that align with the values of where I'm working? And if it doesn't, we've got that clash there, and it can feel like you kind of I guess fighting a losing battle, and it can feel like you are very much not aligned to the work that you're doing, and therefore you will just naturally lose interest, and you might find yourself experiencing burnout. I'll move on to, I believe it's Jill next. Hey again. Um, so if we're looking at sort of like what burnout creation is, it's about what burnout prevention is. And I think just picking up from a few sort of the comments from the chat about sort of like the people feeling guilt, thinking that there's something wrong with them, the lack of opportunities and the constant pressure to do more. And if we look about what prevent, helps prevent it, I know certainly when we're talking to people within the EPS, that guilt, there's something wrong with me that I'm suffering this, is one of the very first hurdles and difficulties we need to work with with people. And actually that sometimes it's because your values are in conflict. It is because of that sense of actually what you're trying to achieve is different the community and the team that you're working with can be difficult. So when we're looking at sort of prevention, the opposite of work overload is feeling that there's a sustainable workload. If I think about some of our clinicians in CAMS, how to hold 100 people on your caseload and expect to do some meaningful work with that is going to bring up a value conflict, let alone a work overload. The lack of control, so feelings of choice and control about who you're working with, who you're seeing, how your diary is structured, can all make huge differences. That recognition and reward, I think there's somebody that put sort of insufficient reward, not feeling appreciated or valued. Now that's not saying we all want, um, you know, it would be nice to have more than a 1% pay rise in the NHS. It is that, it's that bit about feeling reward from when we've done something, done a good job, people feel appreciated that we've done something. And it's that recognition. And if we're working in a community, a team, people around us who have the same values, that sense of psychological safety, as Sarah was saying earlier, you know, sort of saying, I can't work with this particular bit. So, or I've come up and I've had a difficult session with somebody and I just need to get it out of my head. If we're in a sense of a community and a team where our values are aligned, we're respected, we're able to then have those in that sort of psychologically safe way. And then to that fairness and respect and justice for our work, for what we're doing. And that work is valued, our, our values are aligned and it's that value conflict coming and so sort of like, you know, if our values uh, are not the same, and um, then we're gonna get that sort of like dissonance. It's gonna feel uncomfortable. So having worked with Sarah over a couple of years with Angela Kennedy, where she knows that I have my sort of touch, touch light sort of phrases that if people start to use them, such as maladaptive behaviors, uh, I'm likely to start to, slightly foam at the mouth and start to get very cross about things. So I, I've had many a time where I've had to challenge people at times about sort of like their use of language and that's really hard. And not everybody, because there's sometimes that chipping away and that erosion that we've talked about in burnout, feels that they can do that because of actually what do you met back with. And again, that then can link into us feeling devalued, feeling that we're not respected, and it can become that vicious cycle. And that where we're talking about burnout prevention, that high job person fit, you know, where you're doing the job feels right. You feel as if it's like, actually, this is where I'm meant to be. I'm, I'm enjoying this. It, I've got that sense of worth. It's congruent. The team's supportive. I feel supported and we can manage that. That prevents us. 
So some of these things are around systems and our systems and processes at work, not just about us as a person that lead us to having burnout. So as well as changing organizations, which is really difficult, and I, I think both Emma, Sarah and myself would say trying to change cultures is, is difficult within organizations. I don't think any of us would say that this is an easy breeze walk in the park. So sometimes if the organization isn't changing, our place isn't changing, we have to then make some decisions ourselves and develop our own choices. What bits can we influence? What bits can we change? What bits can we control and influence? Okay. So we've got some nice slides about what can support us doing this work. So some of these are fairly simple, but very valuable. And a lot of um, Sarah put right in the top of the chat uh, about the Help for the Helpers book. Um, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Yeah, she's got it there. So a lot of these ideas come from this Help for the Help book. If you've not had a chance to read it, I would definitely recommend it. And no, I'm not getting any royalties for that. But with doing this sort of work, it, there's a lot of in techniques and suggestions in there that help us manage some of the transference issues that are going on, having that self-awareness and different strategies. So we're going to talk about some of these now, what can support us. Supervision. And this is different to sort of managerial supervision. It's different to caseload management supervision. This is about meaningful supervision, where you feel safe to discuss the impact of the work on you without fear of being stigmatized or questioning of your competence. So it's that safe place where you can say, actually, I've worked with this person and these things are maybe getting to me a bit more than normal and can I have the opportunity to explore why that is. Peer supervision, to normalise the experiences, shared connections, reduced isolation, to feel empathy for one another, the workers, and build that sense of compassion for one another so that we're there within our team, building that community and that sense of connection and normalising some of our thoughts, feelings and fears. Or successes. Caseloads, realistic expectations of how many having the autonomy to control the allocation process. I remember myself when I worked previously in a community team because I was the EMDR therapist, as soon as a, uh, anything was mentioned about the potential for trauma, it was, oh, Jill will see these, Jill will see these. And before I knew it, my caseload was just purely trauma. I had no slightly lighter cases. So it was me then having the autonomy to say, I need, if I'm happy to see the trauma patients, I'm more than happy, but I need to not see just that if you expect me to have the same level of turnaround as everybody else. And I, some, I need to protect myself to enable me to keep functioning. I need to have, and um, I have to say I would do that. And then, because I would ask some of the questions, some of the things, someone who had been referred for what, what the GP was thought was a straightforward postnatal depression would invariably end up being trauma based when you started to scratch the surface. Education and training. So it's that bit about sustaining our professional selves, our need to constantly be learning and our feeling as if we're moving forward. And this is especially true in the field of trauma. It helps us feel that we're continuing to cope and navigate the difficult landscape that trauma is and can bring up and the issues. Personal coping strategies, so what they are. A balance between work, home and rest. The balance sometimes as well, I've not jotted it down, it's probably going to come up on the next slide, but it's, it's coming to my head now, so I'm going to mention it. That The balance between connection and solitude, so sometimes we all have that time where we need to be connected to others, but actually there's times where we need a bit of, a bit of peace. S strong social support networks to reduce isolation and trust in the relationships. Activities that prompt your personal sense of identity, whether that's volunteering, swimming, running, it's basically what makes you you, what you like. So what I like will be different to what Emma does, what Sarah does. We might have some of the same hobbies and interests, but we might be doing it for very different reasons. Regular leave. 
And I think we've certainly in this pandemic where we've got people carrying over leave, they've not had the chance to have a pause, a break, a rest, a reflect. So we're getting that community, put my teeth in, that build up effect much quicker because people are struggling because they're feeling like they don't want to abandon their colleagues, their work, their patients. So we, we often hear people going, well, the show's short staffed, I need to go on if I don't do it and know what it's going to feel like. So we end up with people going in, doing extra above and beyond, sometimes at the cost of their own mental health, and physical health. Humour. If we're seeing life at work through darkness, it's trauma, we need light in other areas, watching the funny movie rather than the serious documentary all the time. So it's not saying don't watch some of these dramas, it's just going, be aware of, do you need to have a day uh, or an evening with something like Mamma Mia or on, as opposed to Schindler's List? It's about going, what do I need at the moment to nourish myself and to look after myself? And humour, those moments of light, lightness in our team. Well-being. And when we were first putting this together, um, Sarah sort of was very keen on us putting this in. Self-care is not selfish. If we do not take time for our wellness, we have to make time for our wellness. And I think that's absolutely fundamental that we have to look after ourselves. By being looking after ourselves, that's not just with the physical bits of sleep, rest and eating, but our own mental health. When are, when are we looking after ourselves? What's recharging us? What's refueling us? Then we can be present more with the people we work with because we have more personal reserves to call on. Otherwise, we end up with that tank being empty. Okay. I am not going to go into masses of detail because I think we're slowly run, quickly running out of time but in terms of creating a psychologically safe environment at work I know many of us on this call won't be working in psychologically safe environments um, and at times it won't be all the time even if you do so it's just being mindful of these as I guess within your locus of control as opposed to trying to influence other people um, notice and appreciate the positives I think god we're, we can be so re reactive as services to criticism complaints and things like that and and there's so much good work that goes on every single day and I, I often walk around thinking why aren't we telling people about that? Why, what, are, what are the mechanisms in place for us to showcase the brilliant stuff we're doing all the time? Um, it's really important that we notice the positives and appreciate them and have opportunities. We've got um, in our huddle, we have successes. Um, and we every day we are like under the cosh to make sure we all have something and some days you can tell if we've had a really rubbish day because nobody will have a success and it's like right we'll just wait here until we find one <laughs> but it is about giving people opportunities um, to think about when you have had a really difficult day at work and things feel really rubbish is actually to force yourself to think about something positive that's come from that day and that's I'm just going to whip down to this concept of toxic positivity because I've written at the, bo the bottom hope maintain a positive outlook this can enable change I love positive people I am a positive person but that does not mean you cannot be fed up and sick and miserable and honor all of that as well um, I think there's a podcast um, by I think her name's Susan David it's a book called Emotional Agility I've just bought it she talks about this toxic positivity and what she describes it as is um, when somebody tries to get somebody to think of the positives when they tell them how rubbish things are that is their inability to hold their distress and tolerate their distress as, as opposed to anything else so just being mindful we do need to balance those two things live to learn I would hope we all work in an environment where we can challenge and try and think about um failures or whatever you want to call them mistakes as being growth spurts I hope we work in organizations like that um but it's it's having opportunities or people you can go to where you can challenge professionally challenge on things if you think things aren't psychologically safe I know that's not always possible um 
but even just knowing that that's not available for you is important um, and trying to find a way to, to get to that point. Being kind, I sent an email out last week, which probably everybody was probably irritated by because it was Friday and like everything was really stressful. But I'm like, can we just, just think about kindness for a little while? And just like kindness really is a superpower, I always think. And I think it's, it can totally change your day. You can have the worst day ever. And one small, tiny act of kindness, whether it be wandering on the wards and, you know, there's absolute chaos going on or walking into a team and there's chaos going on and just saying, can I make someone a cup of tea? Or, you know, kind of leaving a little positive, a little note that somebody's brilliant or sending someone a quick email, just sending, saying, I think you're really great at your job. Um, you know, just things like that. It's just being mindful. They're not big gestures, but they can completely change a person's perspective a day. And what I always think as well is one small kind act can kind of overshadow 50 really horrendous, difficult acts as well. It's almost like a little glow in the dark. Taking care of yourself. I think it has been difficult through COVID. Um, I think my, my friend works in ITU. Um, and she said the amount of people that are coming in with alcohol related physical health conditions is just phenomenal and that I think certainly locally we're going to see a huge rise in COVID related um, issues where we haven't had opportunities to go to gyms we haven't had opportunities to see friends we haven't had opportunities to do the things that would normally work whatever it is that keep us kind of stable um, but really I think drinks one of those things as well and I, I know health services are terrible for it um, to go home and have a liquid tea um, as opposed to kind of just sitting down on the settee and just trying to get five minutes but I really genuinely think that one drink can and does often result in it being a, a bottle by the you know a couple of nights and then you end up in a vicious cycle where you just feel rubbish the next day and it really does like we were thinking about burnout and erosion it feels like it helps at the moment but actually in the long run it's just really difficult sorry I was at the alcohol clinical network and the northeast has been the most impacted reason yeah I, that's certainly what she was saying certainly what she was saying and she said she's actually really scared because it's really young people who are coming in of really severe like uh, cirrhosis and like horrendous alcohol related stuff um and also taking care of yourself one of the other things she was saying was that um people are coming in with really like end stage cancer where they haven't sought treatment or really severe sepsis because they're not seeking treatment and I think that's been the other thing hasn't it you know what we need to be thinking about going forward is just keeping a bit of an eye out on our physical and mental health because they're so symbiotic you can't really have one that's well without the other humor well if you were if you work in health services you will find this in abundance everywhere I think it's one of the things that you know, I'm sure there is a physiological rationale to this, Jill, isn't there? Isn't it your, your is it your vagal nerve um, that it, yeah. So when you laugh, um, kind of, there is a physiological um, impact of that in terms of down regulating and just calming everything down. So that's, that. I think maybe from a primitive perspective, that's why we are the way we are in services and we do have quite a lot of laughs and things like that. But I think you can often tell, when it goes quiet in a room or when your most enthusiastic staff, and this is one of the biggest telltale signs for me, is when you've got some of the most innovative, enthusiastic staff who are quiet in meetings or quiet in the office, that sometimes is very, very worrying to me. And not just about them, but about what kind of environment are we creating where staff feel like they can't say things anymore. Let's have a look. Yeah, autopsies. You see it, don't you? Police, yeah. health service, yeah. you know, all of that stuff. People, where, where you see darkness, you have to find light, don't you? And it is, it's um, that discharge, isn't it, of, yeah. of the situation and diffusion. Yeah. Teamwork. Um, we haven't had a lot of opportunity. Um, yeah, undertakers, I'm sure they do. Um, we haven't had a lot of opportunities recently for real connection. And by real connection, what I mean is sat around a table, eating loads of food, having a laugh, having a couple of drinks with team friends and things like that. Not a Zoom call or a, t or a t I'm sick to death of seeing people's faces on Teams now. I want real people. I want cuddles. I want sitting next to each other and touching them too much and being, you know, not, not inappropriately, but, you know, just kind of being, being warm. I miss all of that stuff. I really do. And I think 
you know, we need to try and get back to that at some point. And I pray we don't go down this route constantly where we're, everything's on teams and we do actually have some good old get togethers again um, in terms of meetings and things like that. Developing goals. This isn't just about, you know, individual goals. I think the re it's really important to visualize um, goals and be motivated. But I also think that it's important for the team to have shared goals and the trust and the services you work for. But I also think that when you're in survival, sometimes it's okay to just bob for a bit as well. And I think, you know, often other people can motivate you and pull you through when you're bobbing. So it's okay to just rest and stop and bob for a bit as well. Don't feel like you've got to be smashing life um, every, every single day. But I think an environment that supports a shared vision is really, really important, especially around safety. And just hope, you know, I think one of the most heartbreaking things in the world is not having hope to me it's just the saddest thing ever and I think even you know just just hoping something might change is important without even knowing what that change could be is that the next slide for me so accessing support um recognizing that you need support is really important so just making sure <laughs> this dog honestly she just absolutely cannot allow me to do anything without her being involved um recognizing when you need support is really really important um making sure that you catch it early and don't leave it too long taking personal responsibility for your well-being you know one of the things i think is really important as well reaching out I think a couple of times when I think back to my career, I've worked for two for 22 years and there's been a few times I haven't been OK. Um, yeah, I haven't called it. And it's been somebody else in a meeting who's looked at me and said, are you all right? You don't you don't your smile's not meeting your eyes or you seem a bit off or. And I just think we need to catch that before other people tell us we need to know because, you know, we need to know for our own personal liability and responsibility that we're OK. So it's just checking a little check in every day how am I feeling today am I okay checking in with your colleagues regularly um without uh, balance this without kind of being too exposing because I think if you know somebody who's going through a bit of a big bad time the worst thing you can do in the world is constantly draw attention to it and ask them if they're all right every day I think potentially just checking in with them and making sure they're okay if you notice something and maybe you know that thing of ask twice um, you know, are you okay? Yeah. How many, how many of us do we get this? So we walk past somebody on the corridor, we go, are you all right? And they go, yeah. And you go, are you really all right? You don't seem all right. And they go, oh, well, actually that, and I think there is that thing of asking twice, isn't there? That, you know, people ask each other if they're all right as a greeting. And it, you, you feel as though you can't go, actually, no, things are really crap. Because you think actually they don't want to hear you that. So it maybe is about genuinely asking twice if somebody's OK, if you're worried about them and just making sure that you've got links to local services and things like that and helplines. There's loads of stuff on on online now. Um, but in terms of, you know, Jill's going to talk a little bit about APS and things like that and just about, you know, services that are available in our trust. That's OK, Julie, no problem. Thank you. No problem at all. Um, but, you know, we've got local IAP services. Go and speak to your GP, ring some of the helplines. We've got Shout. We've got other things like that that you can contact, Samaritans, local psychology services, employment psychology services. I would strongly advocate if you've got one in your service, they are amazing, absolutely amazing. So please do go and speak to somebody there if you need to. And just all the self-help resources. Our trust's got loads um, on the internet and I know most trusts will have and some of the resilience hubs as well have, that have just recently opened um just make sure that you get help because we if if we're not all right how can our patients be all right so we need it's a it, we need to look after ourselves really to make sure that we're, we're delivering the best way i'm just going to go and get my dog while jill finish, finishes the slides off So thank you for listening. I was going to just briefly mention for in Tube, we have the employee psychology service. So anyone who's in Tube can access that through the employment support officers. And there's information on our trust internet about that. Um, however, there is the resilience hubs that are forming across the whole of the country at the moment. So there's the Northeast one and there's the auction, the Humber one. So if people who are on this call work in different organisations, you can access support there. And it, that, that's very rapid and supportive. There's also useful information on each of their websites if you need it. <laughs>